once a day that I would pray for you I'd go and misbehave just so you'd notice too Sneaking looks up and down from across the room Good morning, everybody. Out for the morning stroll with the puppies. Uh, Stitch is under the car because it's like 20 degrees outside. But thankfully, the sun is out. Yay. Um, so it's warming up pretty quickly. Today, in this episode, you're going to hear day two of the antifreeze murder. Stay tuned. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. Today is the Friday edition, and you know what happens on the Friday edition. This is a show where we bring you recaps of live trials, but on Friday, we get out of our chairs and we dance. I, first of all, I have to tell you, I got my dragonfly on, my camouflage, uh, and look, uh, my Game of Thrones socks and pink shoes. Who needs to match, right? Let's do the Friday dance. Friday dance, Friday dance, ooh, ooh, ooh. Some of us get paid, some of us have the weekend off. Okay, that's it, that's all you get. <laughs> it was too much, right? Yeah, I've got some friend mail today. Yeah, friend mail, don't you just love friend mail? This is actually Christmas birthday present from one of my subscribers. So happy. Anyway, but first from Alyssa at Diamond Painting Grills, we have this month's sale item. I am an affiliate of Diamond Painting Drills. The link to that company is down in the description. If you want to follow that link and make a purchase, I make a small commission. And they're having a sale right now. I have a whole list of stuff I need to order. Buy three, get one free. Three of these kind of packages here. These kind of packages. They have about 2,000 diamonds in them. So every month she has a special and every month I get the special. You can get them in jars or packages like this. I get the jars because I use them as samples. Um, and then uh, if I figure out that I need more of one of the colors that's in here then I, I, or, I like you like you see here I order them but here are the ones that I have picked out that work in the painting that I'm currently doing what this is is acrylic drills or resin drills I don't know if they're acrylic or resin I think they're resin resin yeah and then that but they have an iridescent coating on them that make gives them this super extra sparkle so Let's find out what this month's are. She also gives me a sticker every month. And this month it's like bling, this really cool blingy sticker. I like that. I like it a lot. I usually give that to my sister. Buy three, get one free. Sale. All right, let's open it. Oh gosh. <sighs> They're well, well wrapped. Little sticker that says thank you, isn't that cute? All right, look, champagne colors, guys, because it's January. So I really like these because there's a lot of opportunity to use these colors. This would have been great in this painting where, where I have all these background here. This was actually three different colors. And if I had had some of these to just trickle in like here and there, to make it give it extra sparkle that would have been super cool so i will put a picture up close so you can see what these are the colors but there's these beautiful you know of course there's a crew 3865 and 5200 which we're very familiar with but then there's other shades really really pretty nice to have this as, a, as an option on future paintings i don't see any opportunity for it in this painting but uh, you never know when I'll be using it. Now, <laughs> I've got these things everywhere. This is a pile that, this is the pile that I didn't need. So, if you want to order these, uh, like I said, every month there's a different set on sale. You can order them in the jars like this or in those packages like this where, you, 
where you will get 12 packages. It costs more to get the packages. These are about 2000 per package. These are about 600 per jar. And I really like these. And I do use these jars when, when they're empty. I use them for other things. Okay, that's uh, my sales pitch for the day. <laughs> All right, let's find out what we got in the friend mail. Oh my God, you guys. <laughs> Peanut butter Reese's. Oh my God. Miniature peanut butter cup. Two of them. <gasps> one to keep, one to share. Oh my God. I'll put those in the freezer because I like to eat them frozen. Then I have a card. Let's open the card. Look at the little gnome sticker on the back. Oh my God, he's pushing a wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow with a, a mushroom in it. Oh, sisters belong to each other. Oh my God, how cute is that? You can't see it. Happy belated birthday to my sister. Oh, she put birthday stickers and cupcake stickers in it. Super cute. Thank you. Her name is Lisa and I love her to death. Love her, love her, love her. She's not really my sister, but you know, I have a lot of uh, sisters by another mister. I have that I just hold very, very dear to my heart. YouTube's been very good to me with meeting these wonderful, wonderful people. All right, what have we got here? Okay, look at how she packaged everything. A little flower sticker. Oh my gosh. Pink tissue paper, of course. Sixty-four hydro. Oh, it's a cup. Okay, hold on. Let's. I gotta break into it. Otherwise, it's. Oh no, it's it's packaged. I see how it's packaged. Okay. Oh my god. <gasps> this is gorgeous. Oh my god. You guys. <gasps> this is unfreaking believable. O M G. Look at this. It, first of all, it says everything is going to be all right on the back. You can't see it because of the glare. But on the front, it has a gnome. Oh, oh and it's pink. I love it. Oh, my God. I absolutely love that. Oh, my God. Okay. Her wrapping is just extraordinary. <laughs> Oh, wow. So, this is uh, a little jar. It says Alaska shot, shot to go, but it's got a little rock in it. She actually explained this to me. <laughs> there was snow in here. It dried up. She actually had her daughter get out in this beautiful scenic area and collect some of, some of Alaska and send it to me. That's adorable. And then we have this. Look how pretty this is wrapped. <gasps> what? Look at this. Oh, it's Alaska. I gotta go to Alaska. I just love this. Oh my God, Lisa. There's more. <laughs> oh my God, girl. There's more. Look how beautiful that is. Wow. That is so cool. It's a shirt. 
it says, oh my God, I love this color. Look at this color. Look. It says, Alaska Girl. I love it. Alaska Girl. Alaska Girl. This is amazing. Thank you so much, Lisa. Oh my God. Look. I, I'll be in my bedroom tonight wearing this with my Reese's and my cup of peanut butter coffee playing Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Back to the show. Let me get rid of all this. Oh my God. Lisa. Oh, thank you. So, so sweet. All right. So today we're going to cover the second day of the trial of Mark Jennings. But first, make sure, oh my God, how much, how adorable is this? Make sure you go and watch the hearing that I covered yesterday. That's the Brian Kohlberger six minute hearing that everybody in the world saw. Literally, he, you don't have to watch it. I can tell you in 30 seconds what happened. He walks in. Now, you might want to go see it because he's got all these interesting scratches all over his face. Like, either he had a, they gave him the world's roughest razor or somebody just drug him by his face somewhere. But, so he walks in, sits down with his counsel. The judge puts everything on the record. And she says, uh, you know, we're here for a status conference. You know, what do you got to say? So... In this state, they have to have a prelim preliminary hearing within 14 days of his incarceration. Well, his attorney stood up and she said, by agreement with the prosecutor, we have decided, you know, we've decided uh, that we would like to do the preliminary hearing or postpone it until late June. I'm available the last week in June. And the prosecutor stood up and said he agreed, and the judge gave them a date in late June, uh, June 26th at 9 a.m. She has reserved the entire week for that trial. It, it's a mini trial. It's not really the trial. It's a preliminary hearing where they have to put on, the state has to put on what evidence they have, and the judge will rule about whether that is sufficient to keep him incarcerated on the charges that he's faced with. And he'll have to enter a plea at that time. So he's gonna sit in jail for a while. Still no bond. He was not, uh, the, his attorney did not ask for a bond. So no bond, he's there. That was it, all six minutes of it. But you might wanna take a look just to see all those scratches all over his face. Like what happened to your face, man? I would, I, if I was a judge, I would have asked him, hey, did you get into a fight with a razor? Uh, what happened? What kind of razors are they giving you in that in that jail? Yeah. So um, I didn't get very far with the diamond painting this week because I, I actually had to pull up a photo of the finished painting and then bl blow it up on my phone so I could distinguish which parts I was looking at and what colors I wanted to replace what colors with because yeah it's complicated it's this is this is a very intricate painting here so I will show you what I finished so far this week now I would like to get as much done on this row as possible I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get into these two sections but here's what took so long this you know getting this part correct because I replaced a lot of yellow and orange here with gold. And I wanted to make sure this wing is finished. And I wanted to make sure that I liked the colors that I used. You can see here, it's it's a, like a crystal that I put outlining the wing. It was supposed to be black and I prefer the crystal. So I'm gonna be working on the other wings today. This part here in the middle is actually part of the door knocker. I'll show you the whole painting so you can get some perspective. Part of this huge door knocker that's behind is right here. So <laughs> very interesting painting. It's gonna be stunning when it's done. 
I actually might consider, depending on the financial situation, getting this one framed. Most of the time, I just, you know, you see it back here, I just tack them up on the wall. We'll see. By the time I finish it, I might be so tired of it, I just throw it up there. But I love this, love, love, love this painting. Okay, the other case that I looked up uh, this morning, because I, I said, you know, what happened to that case was um, late last year, there was a case out of Arkansas where the woman was pregnant and she went for a job, what she thought was a job interview with this woman she met on the internet who picked her up to go to this job interview and basically kidnapped her. Now, the, the Arkansas woman was 31 weeks pregnant. And so here, I'll just put this in here. <laughs> so I have to see it. 31 weeks pregnant. So basically, next thing you know, she, no, she doesn't return home. Her uh, fiance reports that she's missing. Um, he, she also has two children, two small children that she left at home with him. And um, they start a search for her and they do eventually find her and her child dead, but they were in separate locations. Someone had removed the child from her body. The child did not survive. They were in separate locations. Two people were arrested, the woman that picked her up for the job interview and the woman's husband. So I looked that up this morning. They are, they are in federal court. Uh, so it's not a trial that we will ever see because federal court does not allow cameras. But I will try to follow it for you. The case is set for trial in June. I'll see what happens. She pled not guilty. She's charged with kidnapping because the, they found she took her victims over state line. She was from Missouri. So she kidnapped her in Arkansas took her to Missouri and that's where the bodies were found. That's one of the reasons in, it's in federal court. So, all right, let's get to the Mark Jensen case. So some interesting witnesses yesterday. So the first witness was Eric Shore. And I'm thinking, well, who's this guy? Hmm. You know, it's always a mystery to me. So uh, he proceeds to say he's a professional musician. He plays saxophone, teaches music uh, over in North Carolina thinking, okay, how's he involved? Well, he was in the third grade class with David Jensen, who, as you recall, at the time of these murders was eight years old. And at the time of the murders, so was Eric Shore. Now, I don't remember anything from when I was eight years old in third grade. I don't even remember where I was living. My sister will tell me. she Her memory is... Like, I think she remembers coming out of the womb. My sister's memory is so good. She'll say, remember that time? And I'll be like, no, nope, I don't remember it. I really don't. But this guy um, probably still remembers it because he's he's been asked about it for the last 25 years of his life, you know. So the, he was fast friends with David. They had known each other from preschool, grown up together, played together, went to school together, and... The day before, which is December 2nd, uh, Julie Jensen's death, Julie Jensen died on December 3rd. On December 2nd, he remembers David. They were out on the playground playing and he remembers David telling him, my mom is really sick. She's breathing really crazy and my dad won't take her to the hospital. And so he imitated the way what David had showed him that she was this raspy, heavy breathing, like, <gasps> you know, and <laughs> okay. So he also testified that he would, he spent time every Wednesday. They had this arrangement, Julie and David's mother, I'm sorry, Julie and Eric's mother had this arrangement where every Wednesday they would either go to you know, one Wednesday they would go to Eric's house after school and the next Wednesday they'd go to David's house after school. Now on December 2nd, that morning, before they're on the playground, he calls up Eric's house and he says, 
my mom's really sick. Can we go to your house instead today? Because they were supposed to come to David's house that day, the Jensen home. And Eric's mom says, yeah, you, you, I'll, you guys can come over here. And it was during that school day that David tells Eric about his mom's breathing and that mom, dad wouldn't take her to the hospital. So the next person, oh, the other thing he testified to is that after her death, within a few weeks after her death, he remembers seeing Kelly, the, the other woman who moved into the house. He remembers Kelly being there and staying overnight because he, he had seen Kelly in Mark's bedroom. They weren't doing anything. He just remembers seeing her in there and he was in there with his shirt off. Okay. Next on the stand was Eric's mother. And she said that, um, she testified that what I just explained to you, that David went to her house that Wednesday on December 2nd. She also remembers on December 4th, that morning before she took Eric to school at breakfast, Eric described to her what David had told him on the second. Hey, mom, David told me that, you know, his mom was breathing and he imitated the, you know, what David had shown him and that his dad wouldn't take her to the hospital. And so she goes and takes her son to school and within uh, an hour, she learns that Julie Jensen had died yes, the day before. Chilling, chilling. Okay, the next witness that I watched was Angela Martinelli. This was a neighbor, another woman that was in the book club. In December of 1998, when this murder occurred, she was nine months pregnant. She actually gave birth on December 1st, I believe. So uh, she did not find out about the murders till later, or about Julie's death until later on. But she, um, she did testify that she that Julie was very attentive mother, very caring. Um, their sons went to preschool together and she noticed no change in Julie's demeanor prior to the murder. In other words, she wasn't showing any signs of depression or anything like that. Then we get the principal of the local high school who interviewed Julie for a part-time front office staff job. And he said, this was not a computer job because he said, we didn't have computers in the school at that time. So I just wanted a person that could work with the front office part-time that got along with the students, that was personable, friendly, um, that liked kids. And he was required to interview three people before he hired them. So he conducted the interview of Julie on November 20th of 1998, and she was the second person that he interviewed, but he really liked her and wanted to hire her, but he couldn't because he still had to interview one more person, which he couldn't do because there was, you know, first he had to get through Thanksgiving, and then after Thanksgiving, he finally interviewed the last person and then decided to hire Julie. So on December 2nd, he called the Jensen home. Mark answers the phone and he says, can I speak to Julie? Uh, and Mark said, you know, cause he says, I, and he says who he was, he introduced himself and he said, I'd like to hire her for the job that she interviewed for. And Mark tells him, oh, she's asleep. And probably, uh, what, how did he put it? Uh, she's asleep and she's going to be for a long time. And then he laughed and he felt like this laugh was, it wasn't like a full on guffaw, you know, but a, just, he said it was a very chilling laugh that like he just was making light of the situation. Um, it, he said this really bothered him and he felt like something wasn't right, especially when he heard about Julie's death. He thought, he kept thinking about this phone conversation that he had. So he contacted the police and let them know about the phone conversation. And thus he's been involved with this lawsuit ever since. Yeah, I need some coffee. Coffee. Doo, doo, doo. So then we get another neighbor. There's a lot of neighbors here. Kim Shaw. She had been a neighbor of Julie since 1992. She said Julie seemed happy 
with her hobbies, gardening, cooking, and crafting. Yay, Julie. I wonder what she did. Hmm. Not diamond painting. There was no diamond painting in 1998. Um, that she was very involved with her children, and she also saw no change in Julie's demeanor prior to the murders. Then we get Ted Voigt. Ted Voigt is a furniture designer. He was a neighbor, a friend. He socialized with the Jensen's. And this guy was really, really interesting. Originally, he met Julie and Mark when he bought a piece of, he and his wife bought a piece of property across the street from them. At the time, Mark and Julie were getting their home built. He was building a home for him and his wife across the street. And that's how they met. Um, eventually, he finds out that the property next door to Julie uh, is for sale. And he didn't realize, you know, he calls up to buy, you know, to find out about this property and inquire about the property. And it's owned by Mark and Julie. So he buys it. Apparently, Mark was not happy about this because Mark didn't really want to sell this property, but he felt like they needed the money because Julie wasn't working. She was a stay-at-home mom. So he buys that property and he builds a home on that property too. So the home that was next door is the one that he and his wife eventually actually move into. And apparently he had properties all over here and there um, in Wisconsin. So about six weeks prior to Julie's death, he sees her outside and she's crying. So he goes up to her and you know, he's trying to console her and she confides in him. And she says that, you know, she and Mark are having marital issues and that they're having these arguments daily. One of the things that they're arguing about is that Julie wants to get a job. He doesn't want her to get a job. And she thinks that he's seeing another woman. And she kept finding these post-it notes around the house that were well, actually, she didn't tell him this during the original conversation, but then he said about four weeks prior prior to the murder. So, after, you know, after this initial conversation, he said they would have daily conversations. She would seek him out. He worked a lot in his, um, apparently he had, did something in his garage, re, redoing cars or something. And um, she would see him and they would have these daily conversations. So, about four weeks prior to her, she started really getting very, very depressed and anxious. And she told him that she was, she feared for her life, that she thought he was trying to, you know, make her out to be crazy. But she, she, and she was also finding these post-it notes around his computer with all these websites on them that talk about poisoning. Then um, he said, well, you, you should probably take a picture of all that, which she did. She took a picture of it and turns it over to the police. She has, they, they assign some officer to her, to this, you know, and apparently when she showed these notes and things to the officer, he said, you know, what is, what do you want me to do with this? You know, <laughs> what is this? So, so this is what made her think that, you know, he was trying to insinuate that she was crazy. She felt like the officer was also insinuating that she was crazy. Um, he would leave his computer on. These are all things she told this neighbor. He would leave his computer on and there'd be a poisoning website there. So she really felt like, you know, he either one of two things. Either he was just trying to drive her crazy or he was actually planning to poison her. So she saw him. He, the other thing they were arguing about, he, he kept pushing her to see a doctor. And this neighbor said he never did ask, why does he want you to see a doctor? She, he didn't know. He had no idea. Um, and that she does eventually go to see that doctor. Then there was one time she saw Mark on the computer and she saw that he was looking at one of these websites and he takes his feet and he slams the door with his feet. Um, oh, very strange. And then about two weeks prior to the murder, 
she tells the neighbor that she's afraid to eat or drink anything that, in the house that um, you know the, the prior night that Mark was trying to get her to drink wine and got upset with her when she didn't told him she didn't want any of it and um, he was following her all over the bedroom and trying to get her to drink this wine and at one point she saw she, during this while he's following her she looked at the nightstand and she sees that he's got syringes in his in the nightstand so now she's like really not drinking that wine um so this neighbor who's got all these properties he says listen i'll let you go stay at my lake house you know it, and she's like no no I'll, he says i'll give you money you can go stay at the lake house you need to leave and uh, she wouldn't do it. She says, I can't leave without my kids. And if I take the kids, he'll make, he'll tell everyone I'm crazy. And then I'll lose my kids. So she wouldn't leave him. And then she ends up dead. So, very sad. And he learned that she was dead the, that day, that afternoon, because, you know, the fire rescue, the, everybody came out. He goes out to see what's going on, and he's informed by one of the rescue workers that she didn't make it. And he said, uh, he actually asked, asked the rescue worker, is she dead? And he said, yeah, she's dead. So he goes to police with what he knows. Yeah. Now, I suspect, I'm not, one of the, here's, here's the thing with this guy. First of all, he did not appear in person at this trial, this neighbor. Uh, they said he was unavailable to testify, which to me means he's probably dead. So they used his trial testimony from the previous trial. So there were no objections. The, the video was very sanitized. So you didn't hear any objections. You didn't hear any sidebars or anything like that. Um, I listened to the cross-examination. It didn't really see that this guy was wavering too much from his testimony, um, seemed pretty straightforward. He just seemed kind of creepy, like this is the creepy neighbor. <laughs> like, uh, and his wife knew that he was having these daily conversations with this woman, and she so she knew all about it. Um, and didn't really care, I guess. I just think it was weird that she would go to this neighbor and tell him all these things about her relationship with her husband. I just, it's just seems very weird okay yeah <laughs> so that's that's what's going on in the mark jensen case now we have a new trial that started i don't know how closely i'm going to follow this trial because i it is difficult to follow two trials but i will tell you about it and i'll check in on it for you from time to time this is iowa the state of iowa lynn county iowa cedar rapids cedar rapids iowa Versus Alexander Jackson. Alexander Jackson is in his 20s. He is charged with three counts of murder. He murdered his, he murdered his father, Jan, his mother, Melissa, and his sister, Sabrina. Allegedly. On June 15th of 2021, during COVID, where everybody was home getting on each other's nerves. <laughs> So uh, he calls 911, officer responds out there. They think they're responding to a home invasion. He's like, yeah, this black male came in and uh, we had a struggle in the basement and I got shot in the foot and, um, and, and my father's injured. Doesn't mention his mother, doesn't mention his sister. The police go out there. They don't know if this guy's still there. They don't know what's going on. So they go out and they they surround the house and they do a perimeter search. And they've been during this perimeter search, they look in the window and they see there there is a a dead female face down on the carpet, which I believe was his mom. So they um, they call out and they hear. They also see the father, and they're not sure if he's alive or not alive because they keep hearing someone they're not sure if that's the father they're hearing or someone else they finally ascertain that father's dead and they're hearing someone else calling for help um so they go in it's the son he's shot in the foot he's in his bedroom so they start their investigation they find three dead bodies and the son who's been shot in the foot he gets taken to the hospital. They come to the hospital and they start the interview process. So they canvass the neighborhood for surveillance because this young man, Alex, uh, Alexander Jackson, Alex Jackson, tells them, you know, 
I was out sleeping on the porch, so I didn't hear anything. I was sleeping out there with my dog in 80 degree weather. He sleep in the middle of summer. He sleep, 30 degree humidity. <laughs> Couldn't have been very comfortable. He doesn't hear anything, but he he wakes up, he goes into the house, and he, he comes upon an intruder who's holding his father's gun. His, it's a 22, what do they call it? 22 Browning. This is his father's weapon. And they struggle, He somehow they end up in the basement. They struggle over the gun. The gun goes off, shoots him in the foot. The black man flees, and he makes his way to his bedroom so he can make a tourniquet for his foot and then he calls 911. So they canvass the neighborhood for surveillance and they and they can't find any they don't see anything on any of the surveillance. They even have a ring on the Jackson home. There's a you know one of those ring cameras that record, record and he said they could see nobody coming or going in this house. Um, and the back door had been open when they were doing their perimeter search. They noticed the back door was open. So, the father, Jan, had been shot five times, twice in the head, one time in the neck, one time in the stomach. Melissa, the mom, had been shot twice in the head. All of these were close range. Uh, Sabrina had been shot in the chest, and it went through her arm like a defensive thing, and her one time in the face, in her eye. So, they examine the gun for fingerprints and palm prints, and it only comes back with one set of prints, and that is those of Alex. And they're in it, they're on the gun in such a manner that it, the gun would have been pointing down, you know, like if he had held the gun up and pointed it down towards his feet to shoot his foot, that's how, how you, they found the palm and the fingerprints. So then we get the defense opening statements. She said that he went through seven and a half hours of interrogation by the police under the influence of fentanyl because as soon as he gets into the ambulance at the home when they come to pick him up, they give him fentanyl for pain. Um, she described that during this entire seven hour, seven and a half hours of interrogation, which apparently the jury is going to see, that he never wavered from his story. That this guy is a great guy. He played the flute in the marching band. Okay. And he was an Eagle Scout. So uh, he, she said that the night before the murders, he was watching TV with his family. Um, after that, they were watching a movie. After that, he goes up to his room, gets uh, his father's 22 Browning, and he's cleaning it because they had planned to go to the gun range the next day. After that, after it's cleaned, he goes and plays some video games with his friend, and then he comes home to sleep on the porch. And, and another interesting fact that we learned was that the police tested, they did multiple swabs of Alex's body and his clothing and didn't find any blood of any of the victims. Now they were all shot at close range. How did he not have blood anywhere on him? This is gonna be interesting. So those are the opening statements. The defense opening statement was very quick <laughs> and succinct. He's an Eagle Scout, he didn't do it. We shall see. So let's finish up the bog murders. We got one last one. Oh no, we have two. We're going to go ahead and redo the Saturday, Sunday one. All right. Two more of the bog. The bog bodies of Northern Europe, part five, the Grabal, Grabal, G R A U B A L L E, man. He was dug up from a Danish bog by peat cutters in 1952. The 20 to 30 year old man had been executed between 290 BC and 310. Brutally, or, yeah, between 290 B BC and 310 AC. Yeah. He had been hit in the legs in a way that made him fall to his knees. Then his throat had been slit ear to ear. A dent in his head indicated that he had also been hit but more detailed scans conducted in 2002 revealed 
that the dent was made post-mortem, either by pressure from the bog or by a young boy wearing clogs who had walked over the corpse during, during the excavation, an accident he confessed later in life. Aww. <laughs> Grabal Man's stomach contents consisted of a pauper's diet, roughly ground corn porridge, and ergo, a mushroom now used to make LSD. His corpse showed signs of malnutrition. Experts have debated that experts have debated what caused his death. Some theorize that it may have been ritualistic owing to the ergo in his stomach, but others say ergo was a common fungus of the day and the amount in his system was not enough to have made him hallucinate. Yum! <laughs> Steady diet of, what did they say? Heroin? No. What is it? LSD. Yeah. Steady diet of LSD. Okay. Then there was the old Cronin man. The Cronin Man was found in 2003 while excavators were clearing a drain in a bog located near the town of, I'm going to butcher this name, the Gian Dan, Dan Gian in Ireland. Like Grabal Man, old Cronin Man was also brutally murdered, stabbed in the chest, disemboweled, decapitated, and staked to the bottom of the bog. Ugh. That's gross. Between 350 and 175 before Christ. These are, I, well, I'm just speechless. Okay. Unlike Grabal Man, he is believed to have been a person of wealth and status. He had manicured hands and his last meal consisted of grains and buttermilk. Based on these observations, researchers at the National Museum of Ireland think Old Cronin Man could have been a failed king, a royal contender, or a sacrifice to a fertility god. They're doing a lot of sacrificing back in that day, huh? Okay. <laughs> that wraps it up for the week, guys. So what I'll do this weekend is I will finish watching the testimony in these two trials. I'll update you on Monday in Monday's edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. Now, Sunday I will be live. I will have, oh, jeez, that hurt. I just hit my knee. I'll have the owner of Diamond Painting Drills on. She is also painting this painting, but she's done hers a little different than I'm doing mine. So we're going to compare. She's going to talk about her thought processes and how she chooses which drills to replace which drills with. Because somebody did ask me, how do you decide where you want to put these specialized drills? And she's going to go into that a little bit on Sunday during my live. So hope you guys can make it. That'll be at 11 a.m. Central Time. Otherwise, have a great weekend, guys. I will see you on Monday.